I'm proud to announce you to the next speaker, ladies and gentlemen. He's the chief scientist of Burda. Um, can you say the chief scientist? Is this a is this a correct uh, a description for you, Jean-Paul? Scientist. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so he is the chief scientist of Uber Buddha Media, the founder and CEO of Clix. Your stage, Jean Paul Schmitz. Hi. I've noticed that a lot of people have followed the money, so, so now we're going to talk about founding. First, I have to apologize for the title. I, I did not, um, that's not my title, that's uh, Nat Natalia convinced me to talk about this, and the reason she did is because one day she invited me to maybe a hackathon or some kind of founder meeting and I basically told her diplomatically that uh, I would rather get shot in the face than meet another founder. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about why, why I, I, I said that. But maybe before I start insulting people, how many of you are considering yourself entrepreneurs or founders or stuff like this? Who wants to be one? <laughs> Aaron wants to be one, that's very good. So I want to talk to you about a little bit my, my experience with founding. I founded many, many companies. I'll give you some stories of the old days of, of our founded companies and what I learned in the process. And also for a little bit of time I was uh, together with Lars Hinrich and Steffi who sits over there. Uh, we ran something called Hack Forward, where we were giving money essentially to engineers with good ideas to try to turn them into founders. Uh, and how I how that turned out, and basically what I learned from that experience. Uh, and one of the things that uh, in that evening when she invited me, that I started ranting about was that uh, a lot of founders sort of behave like rock and roll stars uh, or want to be rock and roll stars. So they. They kind of play music a little bit. Maybe they even have formed a band, but they're mostly talking about forming the band. Um, and then they don't do anything that is associated with becoming successful as a rock star. So they don't write 1,000 songs per year. They don't, they don't try to get bigger. They don't go on tour every single night. Uh, but they rather talk about these things or, or, or sit in bars and pretend to, to, to want to do it. Um, so this is sort of lifestyle that has developed over the last 20 years, I guess, as to like what do pool founders do, and people read about, you know, the Facebook villa with the swimming pool and how, what nonsense they were doing at that time. Um, and I probably even ranted about exits and how people always talk about these things, whereas exits are really meant for the investors, right? So, so the guys that were sitting there before, they're really, really excited about exits. As a founder, an exit is not really a thing, right? It is, you make money, but you have to take a very important decision after the exit is whether you continue to work for the person that has acquired you and you try to make it bigger or as big as it can, or you just stop, right? But to come back to the rock and roll analogy, it's a little bit like the Beatles would go to number one, and then the, the journalist would say, excellent, no, no, that's your exit. Like, are you going to go to the beach now and not do anything and retire? And we're like, no, I just made it to where I want to be. I, I want to continue doing this. And continue doing this doesn't mean like a hamster going back and not around on the wheel and starting again from zero. Right? And, and the founding moment is a very, um, is a very single point in time. Um, so what is an entrepreneur? Or what is a founder? So founder is not, it's not really an interesting thing because just the starting of a business, you just go to a notary in Germany and you start the business. It's not, not a huge deal. It's really what happens afterwards and, and, and how you make this uh, a big thing. Uh, so I was born in an entrepreneurial family, which in, uh, in Belgium, where we speak French, and the word entrepreneur is actually a French word, meant that my father was essentially building roads and airports and houses and stuff that did not exist. So it's really the sense of entrepreneur means builder. Um, and when I looked at my father basically as a kid, I saw a lot of risk. Like it, it was not like you worked for the government or something, right? It's like there's a lot of risk. Like things can go super wrong. Uh, there's, a, there's no real cash flow. I, I, uh, my father is a very wealthy man, but it didn't look like it for 40 years. Like there's no, you know, you tend to reinvest all the money. Uh, this is before VCs, uh, I guess. Uh, there's no exit, right? It took 
30 years to exit the business. Uh, he exited, I think, eight years after taking his retirement. So there was even a bit of runway because you can't sell these business easily. Uh, full responsibility with no backing. So you don't really have anything behind you, right? But when you say, I'm going to do this, or you, you cannot say, oh, I can't get this done because I don't have the money. No, that's your job as an entrepreneur to get the capital you need to get the job done. It's not something you can complain about. Um, and, and maybe interestingly, lots of people involved, because people tend to have this founding lifestyle as a sort of freedom thing that you become in charge of yourself and only have to answer to yourself, but you find out that successful entrepreneur uh, very quickly get hundreds of people on their payroll if they are successful. Uh, have investors to respond to, have customers to respond to, have even you know society requirements because you have to follow different types of laws and whatnot. And it is a lot of responsibility. And freedom is not exactly the right word uh, associated with that. Um, I became an entrepreneur more or less by mistake, and, and very a lot of my friends, so I know a lot of very successful entrepreneurs, and most of them actually became entrepreneurs more or less by mistake, um, is I wanted a computer, and computers were expensive. Uh, and so my first entrepreneur thing in the, in the very, very early 1980s was that there was only one way to get a computer, and I, when you cannot buy one is, well, uh, you could steal one, but I, I didn't do that. Uh, I, I found a shop where there was a computer and I con a radio shack, and I convinced the guys in the shop to let me use the computer in exchange for demoing the computer if a customer would very rarely come up. Uh, and that would give me time to basically learn the computer. Uh, after a while, basically, people would come and always ask the same question. There were always doctors, lawyers, or dentists, or that sort of people. And they would always ask the same question. They would say, can I get my patient records on this thing? And the answer was sadly no. Yes, in theory, but no. You need the software. So I wrote the software. And then I started basically selling the computer for Radio Shack and giving them the software <laughs> next to it, which allowed me very quickly to buy the computer because the software was conveniently priced essentially at half the computer. So after two sales, I could get my own. <laughs> um, um, I, I learned a, a, an interesting lesson uh, there is I started selling modems afterwards because what I really wanted the computer for was to get on the internet. This is 1982, right? So it's, it's a bit early. Um, and, um, that was also successful, so I was building these modems and then selling them in the Radio Shack. Um, and I would come back home with lots of cash, so that's actually the success of early success of entrepreneur, which caused my mother to worry very, very much because you know you come back with cash and it's quite, it was large amounts. Um, and I think she thought I was selling drugs or something. And, and she, she asked me, what are you, how do you get this money? I said, well, I sell, I sell modems. And she said, what's a modem? Well, that's a thing that you use to connect a computer to the internet. She said, what's a computer? What's the internet? So very early on, I learned that it's very difficult sometimes as a founder and an entrepreneur to explain what you are doing. And this is still true when I'm doing clicks, believe me. Uh, it, it's, it takes a while to explain what you are doing. Um, it, another thing, maybe funny story to explain that I learned, because it has to do with people, is that um, Many, many years later, 20 years later, I met a guy at TED, uh, and through talking, we realized that we must have come from that same little town where there were basically two radio shacks, one with a computer, one without. Um, and I asked him, like, it's funny, we have the same age, different high school, but uh, do you remember that radio shack? And he said, yeah, and I remember you, you're the bastard that took my job. <laughs> and I refused to talk to you for years because you were my competitor. So there's only two kids basically trying to basically go to the same place. And one of them, I suddenly did not have a chance to decide, decided that, that he was my, or I was his enemy or something. And uh, we became friends, but it would have been wonderful if we had done this together because he became also very uh, successful. He created the first ISP in Belgium. Um, I'm, I'm fairly obsessed about what it means to be, uh, many years after that, I sold this first little company to Berda, and then I became a, an entrepreneur but within Berda. So now I'm the chief scientist, but I was the CTO and then the CEO of Boda Digital, uh, which is basically the digital part of Boda. And after 1995, basically, I think I had 
I did not have to raise capital anymore from VC, which I never did, by the way. Um, but I had the luck to have one big capitalist behind me, and I could deal to the capital part of things, uh, which allowed me to, to found uh, clicks uh, quite a few years later. Uh, so when we get to questions, you can ask me questions about how founding uh, uh, really, really works. Uh, I'm quite obsessed about what it means to be an entrepreneur, and if you are interested, it's very interesting to listen to successful entrepreneurs explaining how they built this. And there's even a radio show in America called How I Built This um, on NPR, which I would extremely strongly recommend to listen to because these are people relatively candidly explaining how they founded big things. So, so it's not about because the the internet is a very special thing. Uh, it, it's a very special thing in the, so the time that we are in, and it's a very special time in the sense that you can have a feature ID that you kind of prototype and build and then have 15 people, and you're heavily fueled by a VC that wants to exit, and then a bigger company basically sucks it in, and you become an employee of that company, which can also mean that you're an entrepreneur within that company, and I will come back to that later. I think, in fact, that there are more entrepreneurs within big companies than there are outside of big companies. Um, and um, so it's very interesting to listen to these people, because some of them, or all of them, at one point had to take the, the decision to continue to work for that company even when they were offered exits or even when they took exits. Right? So you exit, but you, you take the decision to continue for another 20 years uh, in what you are doing. Um, uh, so there's a couple of things like how I built this or, or on Stanford, the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader series, which are, if you really want to found a business, I would strongly recommend to listen to these stories because they tend to go for 30 years and not like, I founded a company, exited two years later, then started again and exited again, right? which are wonderful stories, but not necessarily very helpful because they mostly rely on luck. Um, so when you look at entrepreneurs or, or successful entrepreneurs, you sort of notice that they all have things in common. They definitely build something, right? So it's very difficult to be an entrepreneur without actually building something. It, it doesn't actually have to be from scratch. There's many, many examples of people that are known as entrepreneurs but they never created the thing that became then known. So, for example, Reed Hastings did not create Netflix. He was there at the beginning and financed the thing, but he was trying to actually not do it himself. Uh, he got sucked in later, or the McDonald's, for example, Empire did not get actually started by the... Well, the McDonald's brother did it, but the whole thing was not actually made by them. Uh, and it's, it's quite... But you have to probably build something. It doesn't actually seem much correlated with ownership. I mean, some people think that you have to be like kind of majority owner to be the entrepreneur. It, it's not completely true. There are many uh, entrepreneurial uh, successful things where the uh, entrepreneur has zero ownership of it. Uh, one of the examples at Bonner, by the way, was that magazines were typically started by editors-in-chief who had essentially zero equity in the final product, but it's very hard to justify that they were not just as good as other entrepreneurs when you start something that stayed for 40 years and has 500 employees, right? Uh, and, and, and you have lots of stories within big companies like Intel where suddenly some people started a subsidiary in Israel and it became absolutely huge and saved Intel from itself or how you create big things from within companies without necessarily having direct ownership in it. You obviously get compensated and rich, right? But, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with ownership. It doesn't seem to be connected with specific activities because if you look at, at successful entrepreneurs, they tend to do exactly the same as successful executives do after five minutes, right? The, the first time when you start to hire people, and, and my colleague Mark will speak in a few hours, about how you get 200 people or 150 people, etc. your activity will be remarkably similar to any company that has 100 people. It's, it's not like you do other things like because you're a founder or something like this, right? Of course, you may be a little bit more of a maverick or something, but, but you're not hanging out in pubs, in Starbucks, having wonderful ideas and stuff, right? You become very quickly very, very, very uh, operational in a, in a uh, very standard way. Uh, it, it's certainly not a sol solitary thing, right? It's not like the founder, very quickly you end up with tens or dozens or hundreds of people around you. And one of your job is to basically make them as entrepreneurial as, as possible. And, and by this I mean having them own the thing that they do in a very healthy way, meaning they take responsibility for it, but they don't become 
you know, too proprietary about it, and, and try to evolve people into into basically copying your your approach to things. Uh, because if not, it just doesn't scale. So if you become an entrepreneur because you don't want to have a boss or you don't want to have employees or you don't want to deal with people, that's going to be tough, uh, to, to say the least, because you're going to end up dealing with more people than you never and ever dealt with and having more responsibility than you. <coughs> uh, one interesting thing is that it takes decades, right? Um, Amazon and Google are in their third decade. Uh, I, I think for them, it, it's, they're obviously successful now, but it took 20 years to, to reach that moment. Uh, I think after the first decade, there were still headlines in the paper saying Amazon.bomb or these guys are surely going to hit the wall. Uh, Facebook is now in, uh, very healthily in the second decade, or yeah, uh, second decade. A and even five, six years ago, you still had people arguing that they would implode and the stock could not possibly be worth anything. Uh, Microsoft is in their fifth decade, right? So, so entrepreneurship is a decade game. It's not it's not like a month or, or a year, right? So if people ask you, where is your exit after two years, you're like, uh, really? Uh, it's like asking, like, what, what's your job when you're two years old? Right? So it takes, it takes a much longer time than people uh, imagine. And the fun part is actually in the second decade, I would say. The third decade gets a little problematic, as Google and Amazon will soon find out. But the, the, the first decade is always tricky. When I went to Buddha Digital, basically the first 10 years were horrific because you just basically lose money. You basically make all the mistakes in the world. You have to deal with things you cannot explain. You, you are, it, it's very, very hard. The second decade is usually quite, quite good because that's where you become the genius that saw it all uh, before, right? Uh, but it, it does take time to get there. And as an entrepreneur, you definitely have, a, have to have a different relationship with planning than most people have, and uncertainty. Right? So a VC will ask you for a business plan. As a founder, you have to quickly realize that if you plan anything, it's, it's not going to happen the way you planned it, right? And so it's a matter of balancing uh, these sorts of things. So. Because I think my time is running out, they're cutting my time. Uh, coming back to the European thing, is there a difference between the world? I don't think there is much of a difference. But it is definitely true that in Europe, we don't necessarily have the structures that allows you to take these, uh, let's say, healthy approach towards risk and growth and size, etc. Uh, and you will be faced much quicker with things like when do we exit, when do we see the result of, of the capital, etc., which is obviously a bit uh, less prone to huge entrepreneurship like in the US. And people themselves, that's I think what we noticed at, at Hack Forward very quickly, uh, you know, when you would ask them, like, what is the biggest size that you can imagine, was usually about five times what they were now, rather than 500 times. Uh, and, and this is something that if you ever been to Stanford, etc., this is kind of the opposite. They tend to think 5,000 times uh, and dream about what that would mean. Um, otherwise, I think the, the lifestyle of founding is sadly you will find it in every Starbucks of the planet. Uh, and, and if you really want to be a founder, you have to try to uh, see through that a little bit. I'm up for questions because it's a zero, so. Right, the point at the moment. Thank you very much. Jean-Paul Schmitz, all the applause, and then short round. We're going to have the time for two or three questions. Maximum first question back here, gentlemen. Is, is, it, is it an option for us with your in startup to actually directly incorporate US and US and uh, US kind of startup? Is that so I didn't get can you can you repeat it again, please? Is it an option for a European startup to directly incorporate in US and do a European uh, and US uh, kind of startup instead of European? Yeah, but I don't know if it changes anything. So so again, the founding part and all the, the legal aspects of it, it, it really 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 doesn't matter. I mean, I've. I've done startups that started in the US and they fail just as quickly as the one in Germany if you don't do it right or they succeed. I, I don't think that the actual incorporation makes any difference. Uh, I don't even think it makes, let's say you could fly yourself to Silicon Valley and then um, hope to make it there because it would be quicker than Munich. I think you would find out that it's actually much harder because if you come out from, from here you will be 
well, quickly proven wrong, much quicker proven wrong there than you are here because you will not be able to find employees, no one would work for you, and the competition is simply crazier, right? Um, some people do it, right? They do these both sides, but, but this is usually not the first move that you do. I don't think it makes a difference where you started. It's, it's really like if you are part of this environment, it's a little bit easier over there. But if you're not part of it, you're not going to become part of it just by f taking a flight there. <laughs> okay. Another question, gentlemen? Yes. Uh, <laughs> as always, great presentation and <laughs> talk. Um, okay. But to, Take the mic. Um, so you said that founding is it's like it's, every founder has a some sort of a lifestyle that he needs to deal with it. But then, as you said, it's also that you need to be aware of the risk. So when the risk comes to stress, then how do you deal with this? Like, it's a challenge for every successful founder, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, th there is a reason why, if, if you look at the success of, of, of founders, and, and you have to, to really put a parenthesis again, uh, you know, around this, this VC, internet, social network kind of thing, right? Because this is a very special world. But if you look at people who become rich by building really huge things, they tend to be in the late 30s or early 40s, not when they're 18. Obviously, in the newspaper, you tend to believe that everyone drops out of college and becomes a billionaire, but that's not exactly statistically the, the right thing. Uh, and that's often because with that time you, you, you learn to deal with uncertainty, or if you don't, you know that you're not a founder, right? Uh, um, I, I don't have much tips. I, I think at one point you have to learn to deal with uncertainty, etc., and to be afraid of, of things that are truly scary. So, for example, most people are afraid of being wrong. It, it's really stupid to be afraid of being wrong. I, I'm more or less afraid of not doing anything or, or to, you know, you have to be afraid of the right thing. And most people are afraid of, of superficial thing, I would say. And running out of money is obviously something that you should be afraid of, but that's also why you have to be particularly careful how you arrange your financing and not, and not you know, I guess be friends friends with the investor, which I am with pretty much all of them. Uh, you know, you have to make sure that you have that relationship so that they stick around when, when it goes wrong, which it inevitably goes, okay. does. Last short question, short answer, please. What is the number one mistake you see occurring every time with entrepreneurs? Like, if, if you could pinpoint something like they're doing it. Number one mistake. I mean, uh, most of the time, uh, assuming that your original plan is what it's going to become in the long run is, is the big mistake. Uh, so if, if you, uh, pretty much every company that I've seen has, uh, has had a bizarre way of finding the right, the, the, the right place. Uh, it, it's very tricky because if you, if you start growing too fast, for example, and you, you, you get all of your employees to believe in one thing and then you have to turn it, you have to be a very strong leader to, to be able to do that. And so you have to pace yourself or, or, or find a good way to, to move people around. But it, it almost inevitably will be different than what you, what you thought it would be when you started. Unless it's a very trivial type business, like you, you create a taxi company or something. But, but, but if, it's, if it's connected to engineering, it's don't laugh, I have one. <laughs> but but the, 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 uh, if, yeah, it, it always kind of turns around. So you have to be uh, always focused on what move do you have to make. All right, so it's all about the marathon, and I learned that entrepreneurship is a decade game. Jean-Paul Schmidt, thank, thank you very you. much. Big round of applause, thank you very much.